shout out to all our transcript volunteers. You do a great job. We've provided transcripts now with every new show since last summer. So if you want to help us too, then just email hey at uxpodcast.com. That's H-E-Y or H-E-J. Thanks. UX Podcast Episode 235. You're listening to UX Podcast, coming to you from Stockholm, Sweden. Helping the UX community explore ideas and share knowledge since 2011. We are your hosts, Pat Axbom and James Royal Lawson. With listeners in 193 countries from Ecuador to Australia. And I have a little spreadsheet where I keep track of those countries, of course. And Ecuador, that's the first time we've mentioned Ecuador. And, oh, wow. And it's been a number of years since we mentioned Australia, despite the fact it being one of our most well, biggest groups of listeners. So, yes, you can tell James is the organized one. <laughs> <laughs> and David Swallow is a senior accessibility engineer for the Pacciello Group. Previous to that, um, for 10 years, he was an academic researcher in human-computer interaction at the University of York, which is where I studied back in the day. And recently, David has been exploring how we can avoid or reduce anxiety and panic triggers on the web in order to improve accessibility for people with anxiety and panic disorders. So um, anxiety on the web is what David joins us to talk about today. So David, starts off by telling us a little bit about what, what got you um, interested in this um, topic of, of internet um, anxiety. Um, well, it's something I'd, I'd, I'd never really considered before in, 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 the, in the field of um, web accessibility. Um, so we tend to sort of focus on largely sort of uh, accessibility for blind people uh, and, and people with visual problems. And yeah, I'd, I'd never really, really thought about it until I saw a, a presentation by some uh, researchers at gov.uk, you know, the, the UK's government's digital presence. And they included people with uh, anxiety and, and panic disorders in their, their user testing. You know, they were trying to avoid like dark patterns and any kind of anxiety inducing interactions and things in government websites. And so kind of inspired by this, I thought I'd investigate it further, really, and see if I could pull together any kind of guidance on the subject, really. So are there any t- any typical situations that trigger anxiety on the web? Yes. Um it, well seemingly there's there's many. I I started off fairly <laughs> not not very scientifically. I I asked on uh Twitter um you know, what kind of features of of websites and apps make you feel anxious or stressed. Um and I I got loads of suggestions from this. You know, from the user interface components through to through to the actual content. I mean, um uh, Brexit and, and Donald Trump were some of the things that that were mentioned in terms of content. But <laughs> but um user interface things, um people were saying um location requests, notifications, password inputs that don't allow you to copy the text or paste in text, just your very specific little irritations throughout websites. The, the the tweet kind of got plenty of um of responses there and and maybe sort of realized you know, that there, there, there is something here i then tried to speak to um people who who, who have anxiety um uh, you know, in a bit more detail that was quite difficult um finding people to speak to in what way was it difficult was was it difficult to find them or difficult cuz they you know, they they felt reluctant to talk about it well, that's it. Yeah, I think any kind of you know, anxiety or panic disorder or, or just mental health in general, it's quite a sensitive subject. Um, and, and I think people are just a bit reluctant to talk about it. I mean, one person said that they, they, um, they, they didn't want their, their friends or their colleagues to find out about their anxiety. Mm-hmm. Um, some were willing to discuss it, but couldn't really articulate what triggered their feelings like one person said that they found banking websites stressful but it wasn't clear you know was it was it the design was it the color scheme was it was it you know just the nature of banking 
in general. Was it their lack of money? <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, so it, it was it was quite hard, you know, finding people who 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 could talk about it. Um, I went mm. to approach some um, mental health charities um, who um, weren't very interested in, in in helping, and so I turned to various anxiety discussion forums and, and message boards. Uh, on the web and that that was a really great source and and and, and people there were really helpful um, and that that put me in touch with other people and it sort of snowballed from there so yeah so i i, I eventually found some some people to to speak to about it and ask them uh you know what aspects of ui and ux design contributes to that to to feelings of of anxiety and uh yeah from this there was a number of clear themes that uh, emerged from talking to people one of them was urgency. Anything that provokes a sense of urgency or, or, or scarcity was a, uh, a sort of commonly cited source of anxiety. So this will be the example of, of when they say there's like only three seats left at this price. Exactly, yeah. The, the pers- persuasive notifications, uh, as they call them. Um, one of the uh, sort of main, main culprits for this uh, is, uh, is booking.com. Um, and if you've ever used these, it's not just booking.com, but, and they seem to, to crop up a lot. If you ever use these sites, there's, there's all sorts of, um, nudges for you to, to, uh, to, to just book now, you know, hurry now. There's only, only so many rooms left. Um, you know, you can cancel later, free cancellation, all sorts of kind of, uh, anxiety inducing messages that, you know, hurry, are you going to miss out on this? Um, mm-hmm. So that's that's probably the sort of um, most common thing we see. And then related to that are things like countdown timers, any kind of time limited transactions. So um, so you often see this when you're you're booking tickets, and like Ticketmaster would be an, a, a, another another culprit for this this kind of behaviour. Um, and you, yeah, you'll 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 go to book some tickets, and it'll say um, you, you've got like th- three minutes. I think it was three minutes thirty was the example I used um, to complete the transaction. Otherwise, your seats will be reallocated, and that really you know, really ramps up the the, the um, pressure um, mm-hmm. to complete the transaction. And it can also sneakily kind of force people into just going with the default options, which might be you know the premium tickets or or the um uh, next day delivery that sort of thing you know um just because people are hurrying trying to complete the tra- their transaction in time so it's just exactly. it's instilling anxiety and panic as a as a sales tactic but this is the thing isn't it because i mean if you back up maybe i don't know five years people were being taught that this is good good ux you you create the sense of urgency because that optimizes conversion and uh, so people are making money by building sites like the way you're describing that, that you build them so is there bad ux and good ux then i think so um as i've as i've um looked into this i think i think it's a bit of a balancing act i mean initially i was saying and all sort of guidance out there is sort of saying stop these things take away these time limits you know remove remove this pressure but i think there are situations when um it might be okay and in fact um the uk's um competitions and markets authority um have looked into this particularly in terms of booking websites um and there there was a, a a big investigation into this and um, they they ruled that the, these practices were were misleading and aggressive and unacceptable and things like that. Um, and so the 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 well, they focused on six websites to begin with, like you know Expedia and Booking dot com. Um, I can't remember all of them. Um, and they were they're required now by law to um, to uh, not you know not not create this pressure. But mm. reading the the principles closely it it describes how these persuasive notifications are permissible under certain com- conditions and it says that um they, they statements about popularity and availability must um be clear uh must disclose the assumptions limitations and qualifications 
that are relevant to the statement and must be substantiated by the hotel booking website's data. So this this has got me oh, thinking, so really, is a little anxiety okay or, you know, uh, acceptable under these certain conditions? If, if it's based on uh, actual data, if it's actually giving users a service, if, it, if it's helpful to know that there is only one room left, is that arguably a good thing? Oh, you see, now that's fascinating because that is actually a good thing to know there really is. Well, I mean, that's the same as going into a supermarket and seeing this, like, you know, one item left on the shelf. Okay, you don't know how many they've got in the storeroom, but, I mean, it's it's a very obvious visual thing. It's, oh, go, I got the last one. Yeah. Um, but, it, but it requires trust, and mm. that, it requires trust and understanding, I guess, that you, mm. that the data is true and the data pres- presented to you is, is presented in a way which is true, um, and you understand how that data is presented to you. Yeah, ex- exactly. That's it. Yeah. Um, and they were also required for things like saying, um, hurry, like six people are looking at this now. And they have they can't just say now. They've got to say what time period that, that spans. So, you know, in the last 24 mm. hours, for example. So it might not be that every, you know, people are going to ah. do this right now. Mm. Um, so it's just about substantiating it with, with data and, and, and being honest um, about what you're showing. And, it, and if it is providing a service if it is helpful to know um then it you know it's, it's arguably okay so that's why i think it's difficult you can't just say no stop doing this completely i think there's a bit of a kind of balancing act of of, of weighing it up this makes me think of uh make, makes, makes me think of mailchimp uh, because everybody was raving about how mailchimp was so funny in its tonality as it was speaking to users and, it, mm-hmm. and some users actually found it offensive and distressing and uh, in the end uh, MailChimp actually added a setting where they allowed people to turn it off and in this case I'm wondering if that isn't the solution because it does sound like even in these cases where you have reason to add that information some people will still be stressed that they could actually be allowed to switch that off if they don't want to see it yeah um, yeah I mean, some people have suggested what. Why don't we introduce some kind of um, a, a bit like you know, the, there's a media query for um, prefers reduced motion, like a setting you can pick to 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 cut out all the kind of animated effects that cause problems yes. for people with with um, motion sickness. Yeah. Uh, so we have dark mode now as well. And yeah, light mode. exactly. And someone's yeah. suggested, could we have prefers reduced anxiety as some kind of setting? <sighs> Mm, um, yeah. or, or prefers reduced huh. tension, something like that, um, which it sounds a really appealing idea. Um, I just don't know. I think the problem with this, there's so many triggers for, for anxiety that, you know, trying to do some kind of general thing that that could apply to would, would be difficult to do. Uh, and, and different triggers affect people in different ways. And I, I think it would be would would be hard to to implement something like that. But um yeah, I mean, on a certain on a site by site basis, it's something you could disable. It's definitely an interesting idea, but but it but it makes me start to think of how um, where would you stop? Because um, another option then could be um, prefers uh, plain English. Another one could be um, or prefers less complicated concepts. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's there's plenty of different ways that you could you could then have toggles that say your preferences according to how it makes you feel or how you judge your abilities to be or how you expect your abilities your required abilities for a um, to be to, for a particular service or website yeah exactly yeah i mean all these things are in like, the accessibility guidelines but yeah but when do you when do you turn it into a from a guideline recommendation in, into um you know, a, a user's setting that you you have to adhere to. I, I think it would be hard to to implement, really. I mean, you, you do see it on a on a site by site basis. Um, because I mentioned Booking dot com, there's loads of um browser extensions that have that have, that have come out uh for uh, stripping out all these persuasive notifications um from right. Booking. There's like shut up Booking dot com and no no <laughs> stress Booking dot com, something like that. Um, and yeah, that just cuts out those components um, and one of them actually rewrites certain phrases 
uh, in, a, in a more calming way um, to yeah to pre- pre- present a calmer experience. Um, but yeah, that's very targeted, you know, very specific to booking.com. So I don't think there's anything you could do generally. That's really interesting, though, because it shows how much booking.com really owns that space. So it's not people don't abandon the site because they think it's being unethical. They actually try to rewrite the site itself, which is what the sort of the open structure of the web allows you to do. But it doesn't solve the underlying problem, of course, because a lot of people won't understand how to install plugins, for example. No, true. Yeah. And it's always going to be combated by the kind of business decisions behind all these, you know, and it, uh, these techniques obviously work for companies, um, but, you know, otherwise they would, wouldn't be doing them. So to, trying to persuade them to, to move away from them will, will always be difficult, I think. Because th- it comes down to the reason that the companies are doing it, right? Because now you're saying the reason they're doing it because it makes them money, whereas in those guidelines that you read to us, the reason they should be doing it is because it helps people. When 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 that becomes a conflict, that's when you have a problem and it comes down to are you respectful of the people visiting your site and are you listening to their needs? Yes, exactly. Yeah. And I think, I mean, there was a study that showed the effect of these dark patterns. Um, in the short term, sure, they're effective, you know, and, and can in- increase conversions. But long term, it reduces trust uh in that in that brand it depends whether they're 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 thinking long term and 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 what these dark patterns are are sort of saying Mm. about them uh, in the short term because that's the thing it always boils down to isn't it it always comes down to short term and long term and and people tend to argue that well companies to survive in the long term and be sustainable they have to be act in an ethical way and they have to be good but it actually does seem like a lot of companies can keep acting unethically and they nothing no harm will come to them we'll just make more and more money and be able to uh, just pay off uh, whatever mistakes they make if you think about gdpr and and that because you have enough money then you will actually just be able to pay it off (laughs) yeah exactly there was a um investigation by who was it the norwegian consumer council um and it's called deceived by design and they looked into the um privacy privacy intrusive default settings um by facebook and google and microsoft and they were, they were very hard hitting they were saying you know these were unethical this was misleading exploitative but nothing really has, has has changed as a result of this so so for, so far we'd be focusing largely on um the deliberate um creation of anxiety um through dark patterns and on examples like booking.com but what about the situations where we um accidentally create anxiety because that happens an awful lot as well i guess what through through designs are you thinking yeah yeah i mean i mean just an example i mean when you asked the question that well you started talking about the question at the beginning of the the show i was thinking of course what makes me anxious when i'm using um websites and the first thing that popped to mind f- for me was was that that moment after you've booked something or that moment after you've bought something. Mm. And you know, if, if I make the comparison with like Gmail, where there you you can unsend an email for like four seconds after you've sent it, because it's almost always that little window of time where you realise, oh damn it, I didn't write this. Oh, I should have. Oh, did I actually put the right day? Um, yeah. But a lot of time we don't we don't have that undo when it comes to. Like you know, booking flights or or you know buying a um, and a, buying a, a a new washing machine. I know exactly what you mean. Um, an- another another theme that that came out of this um, was uh, powerlessness, um, and this is where people. Well, the, the, the sort of common example here was, was in um, things like say Facebook, where uh, sort of. <laughs> Uh, critical actions like like deactivating your account were hidden in you know deep dark corners of the website um, people couldn't find them you know they had people have to search on google to find the deactivation page for facebook they, they make it very hard um, to get to um which made them feel powerless you know they they, they didn't have that that autonomy to to close their own account um so this was a you know another sort of common theme that came up in it 
Um, but again, this is a tricky one to to resolve, really, because um, there is one argument where you could say, okay, well, let's remove any uh, friction uh, that gets in the way of users. You know, make it very clear for them to make it very easy for them to uh, get to the you know deactivation page or the contact page, whatever it is. So that's that's one one argument and there's certainly you know lots of guidance um and, and guidelines to to support that um but it also might be a case of um applying friction as well um a bit like what you're saying with um the undo option um on on, on uh, gmail sometimes it might be a case of putting little steps in in place little hurdles of, of, of such which um ultimately benefit the user. Building up from the, the undo button on, on Gmail, um, there was something I, I, I found on um, banking websites, uh, and in particular Monzo, which is a UK um, online bank. And um, they prototyped a, a thing for people with um, bipolar disorder. And they did some research and found that people with bipolar disorder sometimes make unnecessary frivolous purchases late at night uh, you know during manic episodes and then the next morning they sort of confronted with what they've done you know that can trigger further depression to try and avert this they, they built in a a method of delaying transactions until the following morning so you, if you, you enable this setting it'll tell you the next morning you spent however much last night would you like to review these purchases and then you can authorize it the following day this is something that's really kind of snowballed in the last year and lots of other banks are doing it now particularly in terms of gambling um, and gambling website and gambling transactions um, and putting these blocks in place that just increases the friction it adds extra hurdles to cross some of them require you to speak to a, a telephone operator um, you know, to, to release the block or whatever. Um, so um, it's just sort of building that friction in um, to help people. It's sort of positive friction, I guess you could could call it. So yeah, it, it's, it's another balancing act really, you know, it, it, how, how easy do you make it or, or, do you, or do you put these hurdles in place um, to sort of reassure uh, anxious users? And then at the same time, not putting hurdles in place that could it could actually increase um anxiety or stress because they don't they don't realize what's happening exactly right yeah. you know if you if, if transactions are maybe delayed to the morning then you might wonder why hasn't the transaction gone through yeah so you, yeah. you have to understand the process and, and learn that in order to be reassured and not feel as anxious yeah yeah so it, it's uh it's another another balancing act really it's, it's um, a difficult call you can't just say okay make everything easy and friction free there may be, you know, genuine use cases for building in um, friction. So the question is then, I mean, can we find that balance? Yeah, well, I don't know. I don't, I don't know what the best solution is. I don't think in this case that kind of hectoring guidelines are necessarily the answer. If you sort of look at uh, uh, web content accessibility guidelines which are all very uh, unambiguous they're meant to be you know ob objective means of testing the accessibility of your content and there are parts of uh, of WCAG that um, relate to anxiety and panic disorders it's not mentioned specifically um, but um, parts of it do benefit like the, you know re removing time limits or allowing people to extend time limits that's that's a, a guideline but I'm not sure guidelines are necessarily the answer here. Because as I say, it's not always clear cut, don't do this or do do this. Um, so I, I, I don't know the answer, but I, I, I feel like we need something that's a bit more, uh, more like things to consider, um, more like a, you know, a kind of decision tool. Um, to bear these things in mind. This could cause this, could cause that. Um, and, and, so sort of allow people to make an informed decision about these these issues. What form that should take, I'm not entirely sure, really. I'm not sure what, it, what is helpful. But a process wherein you actually make sure that you talk to people who are vulnerable, put people at risk, people with different types of mental disorders, that you actually involve them in the creation process. Sure, yeah. I mean, it, mm. all of these themes come, come back to that, do they? 
yeah. does it benefit the user you know so mm. um so yeah so having a user-centered design um w- would certainly be the way of tackling that but yeah um yeah it, it, it's it's there is a lot of ambiguities I've, I've as i've you know i've come to learn over the last year or so yeah and i guess we're back to that um, thing where um how how you perceive your user to be isn't perhaps um all the time how your users actually are yeah yeah so be so be more inclusive you know, by having more contact with more types of users you become more exposed to the the different situations they find themselves in and the different ways they perceive your products and services yeah yeah exactly yeah um i i think that will always benefit any kind of uh, approach like this just just yeah make it use, user-centered focus on users test things with users and you'll you have a much idea of what you know the impact is going to make exactly Thank you. Great words to end on. Thanks for joining us, David. Thanks, David. Thank you. So I have this question about whether there is good uh, and bad UX. And of course, that's something I have a lot of opinions about. But the key, I think, in the end, of course, is that there is just UX. And whether or not it's good or bad is down to people and people's intent and people's uh, risk management and, and assessment, and really the outcome, whether you have good or, or bad intent, the outcome may be good or bad. Uh, so you have to manage the outcomes and you have to figure out who is getting hurt. And that is sort of what David's been doing. He's trying to find out who could potentially get hurt by the things we are building. And he's he's found this uh, this area of anxiety where, where people are being triggered by different interface elements and they're being triggered. And he had the... Uh, the four different uh, uh, topics that we, I think you said we basically only covered two of them. Yeah, we, uh, we covered, um, um, what was it, urgency and um, powerlessness. powerlessness. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and there's two more was unpredictability mm-hmm. um, and, and sensationalism. Uh, he mentioned yeah. sensationalism as content in the beginning of the interview and, and unpredictability, that theme. Um, examples of, of that would be um, the, the opt-in checkboxes where it's got like double negatives. So tick this if you do not want to sign up for this newsletter. Exactly. And so it, it all becomes complex because then you realize but for some people this will work well. And we, we, we talked about in the interview that yes, this makes money for the company and a lot of people won't have any trouble with it. Uh, but then you have this group of people that will have a lot of trouble with it and it may actually hurt them, and it may even impair their ability to lead normal lives. Uh, so in the end, it comes down to ba- that balance of uh, how okay am I with hurting a small number of people to benefit myself and others? Uh, and that is a hard balance for a company if you're not even aware that it's happening. Well, I think just reflecting on... Um if we go think back to like the uh, example we use with booking dot com and the um, um, the scarcity uh, principle mm-hmm. that we we talked about there, that you know me and you, Pa, we've been in loads of of like creative workshops, conferences, and otherwise during the years, and and you know there's many an exercise where where you you've got to team up and you've got to come up with um, like a product or an idea or something as part of a, a tr- as part of an idea or workshop exercise, and mm-hmm. you know you know we really love coming up with solutions as UXers, you know thinking we've understood the problem or we've 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 got some research and we can really come up with an, an answer and that that thing about when you're booking a hotel room you can see how the research shows well you know when i'm booking a hotel room you know what what would, what would be useful to me well it would be useful to know how many hotel rooms are left so i can decide to book this now or later you know fair enough that that sounds you know, reasonable so then you introduce the the data which says you know there are five rooms left and so on and you know, so the, the the actual inf- communication of the of the of that data in itself is potentially helpful, but then right, but then somebody comes along and says that well we could coerce people even more if we actually told them hurry up there is only five rooms left yeah and so, so then you're using language to actually make it, the urgency feel even more pressing yes so you've taken original like insight mm-hmm. something in which people you've found out would be useful and then you've manipulated it you've you've contorted it to be something more persuasive and more mm-hmm. harmful but something that struck me as, as an interesting aspect of this is uh, connected to what um, david said about the the um, recommendation in the uk about how you if you do use things like scarcity that you you need to be like honest and you have to say what um what time span it's talking about and so on that 
we've got a, a collective responsibility here because if you're if you're the one website that's that's really giving the useful data you you you're producing honest open correct live scarcity data yeah. then it's still going to make people anxious because the we've created on a on on mass an expectation of anxiety you you're expecting to be in a certain way because booking.com does it in a certain way so if you do it, if you do it a different way it will still have the effect of the more like right. bad UX, even though you're, so you're doing saying good essentially UX. the the unethical companies that have been misusing this, they have actually made it so that people uh, really interpret all these uh, patterns as being of of urgency, as being something that they have to react to in a certain way. So their their bodies emotionally react to the fact that there is only five rooms left in a negative way, even though it was a positive intent. Yeah. So even if you do a, the good UX, there, you know, yeah. we've conditioned people, uh, I'm theorizing now a bit, that we've potentially conditioned people to have mm. anxious responses in certain situations, even though they're not. I mean, right. I, I suppose another example there would be, if, yeah, we, well, we, we suffer from anxiety and, and, um, um, and so on all the time in all different aspects, not just on the web. Um, for me, I, one one thing that makes me anxious is going to a, a new lunch restaurant when we're, when when we're working and and going for lunch. And if I don't, I, the first time you go there, you don't know the rules of the game. You don't know where you're. You know, are you supposed to queue there? Do you, you know what's the menu? Yeah. What do people normally <laughs> order? How do they order it? Do I do I wait here for the food? Do I go to my table? Uh, all these like rules that everyone else seems to understand and know because they go there all the time. But this is my first time at the restaurant. Mm. Uh, and I don't know them. So I feel excluded. I, f- I get anxious because I, I feel I should know the rules of, of this lunch place. Mm. Um, of course, yeah. That's, that's an excellent example. And there are so many situations where we come into and we are new and we feel anxious because other people seem to know what they're doing. Uh, for me, it, it sort, this sort of circles back to uh, what the research that David said he was doing around how do I found out, find out what is causing people to feel anxiety? Uh, how do I figure that out? And there's a lot of ethics even in that research because you have to realize that anxiety is a word that we throw around quite easily. Uh, so it, it's sort of, there's a general anxiety feeling, but there's also, of course, a mental health disorder or mental health issue here that's at play. And people may not even be aware of why they are feeling excited. It may be totally unrelated to the situation, but it triggers something that relates to something else. And so there, there, obviously there has to be some sort of professionalism involved in helping to interpret what is happening. Mm. I think this, um, I understand why David doesn't think this, mm. well, he doesn't have a really kind of proper answer to all this because mm. it is a balance and it is yeah. complex. Um you know, we've, I think the advice of, of including more varied types of users in your research is effectively timeless advice. It's, it's, it's excellent, um, yeah. including people who are potentially anxious or, um, or get panic attacks and so on. It's a, it's a great way of doing it because we do have that, that pull from organizations to convert, to, to get people to do things um, and understanding the cost of getting them to do things isn't always transparent. It's a hidden cost in many transactions. We get them to do this now, but we make them suffer later. Yes. Or maybe even during. Mm-hmm. Um, so re- doing research, including people of various types in your research, will help you uncover that hidden cost sooner. Exactly. It'll help you articulate to the users what is going on, because I love that actually David also made the points about friction, uh, that you add friction to boost awareness of what is happening so that people people can make better choices, which relates to consent. Because for me, it always comes back to consent. Am I approving of, of what you're doing to me? Am I, and to, to approve, I need to be aware. So I need to be educated. And we really need to allow things to take time, which is something really bad at as well. Mm. I think... Uh, of course, I want you. Both, I want everyone to go in and read um, mm-hmm. um, the blog posts that um, David did around these things, so you get a bit more about the sensationalism side of things as well, to do with content, because mm-hmm. um, that's that is another aspect that we we haven't really dived deeply into today, but it's good to read about. Yeah. 
So thank you for spending your time with us. Uh, links and notes from the episode, of course, found on uxpodcast.com. If you can't find them in your pod playing tool of choice. Uh, you can also join us for a UX podcast Fika, um, which is where we online have a little chat and gathering. And um, you can maybe tell us what you've done to reduce anxiety in the products you work on. You can find the times and days for um, our Fikas on the website. And remember, you can contribute to funding the show by visiting uxpodcast.com slash support. And before we finish off, recommended listening. I'm going to suggest episode 85, which is actually a, a show from six years ago now, where we talk about the psychology of persuasion with um, Bart um, Schultz. Um, oh, Bart. I remember that, that had must... I guess that's a pretty crazy episode. It, it's, yeah, <laughs> but also I think we it's one of those ones where I remember I remember learning a, a yeah. lot about the psychology to do with persuasion from that chat with Bart and it started a lot of thoughts for me that have carried on over a number of years. Very useful yeah. interview. Remember to keep moving. See you on the other side. So, Pai, um, a lorry load of tortoises crashed into a train load of terrapins. Okay. It was a turtle disaster. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> Do you not get that at all? Turtle disaster. Y- you've got to have a Yorkshire accent, I think, to understand it. It's a turtle, it's a turtle disaster. It's a turtle disaster. So... Probably would have worked better with two Yorkshiremen doing it.